Colossians chapter number 2, we're going, we're going to begin reading in verse number 8. <clears throat> Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him up from the dead. Now the Apostle Paul's writing an epistle to the church. He starts off this chapter chapter number two, saying that he wishes that this church and the church at Laodicea and that others, that they would have known him in the flesh. He said, you know, I wish that I could be there and that you wouldn't just get a letter from me, but that I'd be able to see you and you'd be able to understand what great love I have for you, what great passion I have and, you know, how it stirs me to hear that you walk in love, that you do those things that, you know, as unto God. See, they had never met the Apostle Paul. In fact, chapter number one goes on to say that uh, Epaphroditus, if I said that correctly, was the one that went and preached to him. Okay, but the Apostle Paul finds out that this church is planted. Maybe he's the one that sent Epaphroditus. Well, I don't know. But he finds out that the church has been started, that they're doing good. God burns it on their heart, or on his heart, to write them a letter saying, instruct them a little bit. One, encourage them. That's what chapter number one is. He's encouraging them. He's saying, hey, life can be hard. He says, I know, I know that pretty much better than anybody else. He says, but I don't have it as hard as Jesus had it on Calvary. And he encourages them. Okay, then chapter number two comes around. He starts instructing them. Okay, what did I do with my handkerchief? Here it is. Starts instructing them. I mean, verse number three, we find out that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, what's that mean? Well, verse number two also says that, you know, that their hearts may burn with the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. What's that saying? There's a whole lot about them that we ain't figured out, can't figure out, won't figure out. You can spend all day long thinking about God. There's still going to be things you can't figure out. In fact, it's not just that there's mystery surrounding God. It says in God, in Christ, are all treasures and wisdom or are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hid? In other words, he's got all the answers that you need, but that doesn't mean that he's going to share them with you ahead of time. Doesn't mean that God's going to disclose all of his omniscience, all of his all-knowing. I mean, can you imagine God sitting down? And I imagine, okay, it's, it's fleshly. Anybody remember that old Batman movie with Jim Carrey in it as the Riddler? Yes. And he used to have that thing that he'd stick to his forehead and it sucked the knowledge out of everybody else's head. You imagine if God sat you down and then did that to you with everything that God knows, you'd just explode. Right? You wouldn't be able to handle it. Let, try and figure out how God said, let there be light and something that wasn't was created and it was exactly how God wanted it to be. I mean, I know the answer. He's God. But try and figure out how that happened. I'll wait. Right? Not going to happen. Explain how Jesus could say, peace, be still, and then the winds and the waves, you know, just stopped. Yeah. Right? He didn't even have to raise a hand. He just turned around and said, peace, be still. Hmm? There's a lot of mystery there. Let's see what the Apostle Paul's trying to get is just like that song the kids' choir sings. You know, I may not know everything that he is, but he's just what I need. I may not be able to comprehend the fullness of God, but I do understand that the fullness of God means that he's got everything I'll ever need. He can take care of me, not worried about it. Okay, then we get down into our verses. And in between verse number 3 and verse number 8, he's talking about being rooted in Christ, growing up, becoming strong, allowing Christ to live in us. Then in verse number 8 is the caution. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world. 
No one talks about the world. It's not talking about earth. It's talking about society, culture, men. Okay, worldliness being the opponent of the opposite of godliness. That's what it's talking about with the world. Right? You can go out there and you can look at a tree. It's not meaning that because the tree is a part of the world that it's against God. Now, everything that God created sings praises unto him. But it's talking about worldly man, fleshly man, carnality. So what's he warning? Well, first off, philosophies. And if you ever took a philosophy class, I pity you and I'll pray for you because they stink. I took a few of them. Why? Because I had to take something. I figured, well, I might as well figure out what these jokers think. They, they think a lot of different things. You put somebody you know, in a room alone long enough, they'll start thinking of a whole lot of crazy stuff. And they'll find a way to make it make sense to them. And if it makes sense to them, it means it makes sense to the flesh. It makes sense to the carnal man. And if other people who are carnal hear something that is carnal, they're liable to believe it. But see, as a Christian, we are both carnal and spiritual. The struggle is to decrease carnality, increase spirituality. Right? I will never get to the point, I hate to break it to y'all, we'll never get to the point where we are no longer carnal at all. The flesh is always going to throw up temptations. Right? But in every temptation, God makes a way of escape. He doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able Right? That's a great mercy, but we got to deal with that. Right? Your flesh, from the day that you were born until the day it goes back to the dust of the earth, right, will crave carnality. You've got to deal with that. There's carnality around you. Right? No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to make you know, a little Amish village where everybody is saved and everybody is living 100% spiritual. You're going to go to the gas station and somebody may cuss you out for some reason. right? You may accidentally, I'll assume that it's accidentally, cut somebody off in traffic because you didn't realize that the road was closed up ahead and you have to get over now and that person thinks that you jumped in line. No, 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 I just didn't know that the road was ended. Okay? By the way, that's happened to me about 900 times on 275 since they've shut down about two lanes. And I'm not going to lie, I've considered, I didn't ponder how to do it, I've considered, you know, committing manslaughter, right? <laughs> Why? Because I waited in that line for 30 minutes, and then that person just, oh, nope, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? I have to deal with that side of me. And I hate to break it to you, even if you lived in a community of 100% safe folk that were doing their best to live 100% spiritual, Amen. people are going to offend you, and they don't know it. Right. Right? What's that? That's your flesh. Amen. That's what we heard about on Wednesday night, that root of bitterness that can take hold of your heart and destroy not just you, but many. But why is that? Because we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. We do not belong here. We will always be at enmity with those in this world, with ourselves. Because my heart, you know, my conversation's already recorded in heaven. I'm seated in heavenly places already. God sees me as I will be there. I'm already there, but I'm also here. I'm just waiting on graduating. Right? But I've got to deal with here before I can get there. So the Apostle Paul said, be cautious of anything. That has to do with your reasoning. Vain deceit. What's that? It puffs up what man is. It makes man seem better than man really is. What is man? Defiled with sin. Why do you think the psalmist said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? We're lower than a dog. You know, I'm, the Gentile woman, the Syrophoenician woman came and said, You know, even dogs get to eat from the master's table. Right? She was a Gentile. But let's be honest, we're a whole lot lower than Gentiles. We're sinners. We're the off-scour of the world. Trees didn't sin against God. They do what God intended them to do. They follow God's directions. Right? What did man do? Man disobeyed God. We're lower than the low. Grass does what God wanted the grass to do. It grows. Right? Rocks do what God intended them to do. What do rocks do? They sit there. Right? Everything else in nature 
does what God intended it and it brings praise and honor and glory unto God. Man chose to disobey God. We're lower than the low. So what is man that God would even consider the thing that he created and chose to disobey him? That's when you really start getting a little bit of that mystery and that knowledge and the wisdom and you start understanding how powerful and how great grace and mercy really are. When you start realizing how bad we really were but yet God chose to love us on purpose anyway. That's a little bit of that wisdom, a little bit of that knowledge. And where do we get that? Verse number 7, because we're rooted, we're built up. You get in here, you're going to start learning a whole lot of things that will help you on the days that you're flesh, on the days that the world's trying to appeal to that carnal nature of yourself. If you're rooted and you build up, you can go back to those promises. You can go back to those truths that God has shown you, and you can say, no, nah, I'll just continue to choose Him. But beware of anything. That makes man sound like, well, man's not all that bad. No, man's bad. In and of itself, man is hellbound. Not because God intended to send somebody to hell, but because there's no other place for them. Okay, then we go to verse number 9. Talking about Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we thought on this a little bit before. But who has seen the Holy Ghost? Nobody. Who in the flesh has seen God the Father? Nobody. What is the representation in a body that we have of God? Jesus Christ. The one that came, born in a manger, lived some 33 and a half years of perfect, sinless perfection. Then, as a lamb before the shears was silent before those that accused him and called him, you know what they accused Jesus of and convicted him on? Saying that he was God. Because in their minds, that was blasphemy. He said, I and the Father am one. They said, well, he made himself equal with God. Yeah. And they killed him for being God. That's what it was. Then, three days later, God raised him from the dead. Right? Ascended evermore as our interceder, as our high priest, as the lamb that became Lord. Well, he already, already was Lord. But one day he's coming back to sit on the throne of David. He'll be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. Every tongue shall confess that. Right now it's already true. Just people haven't realized it yet. Okay, what's the point I'm trying to make? He is the only representation thus far of what God in a body looks like. So when it says dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, it's not saying that in the body that Christ had was all God, although that's true. He was all God and all man. But that's the best that we have. Right? John got a little glimpse and he said, I can't really describe it because I don't know of anything that looks like what he looks like. His skin kind of looks like brass, but really it's not brass. Right? His hair was white, but I can't describe how white his hair really was. Right? His eyes, they looked like, but they weren't really fire. Because fire wasn't as good as what I saw. Right? He's trying to describe heaven with man, you know, worldly terms. He's saying, it's got 12 foundations. I, I can do my best to describe them, but you just got to see it to believe it. Right? He's saying, it's just wonderful. Right? But in Christ, ignore the bodily part. He was the fullness of God in the body. But the point for today's lesson that we're talking about, in Christ dwells all the fullness of of God because if it dwelled in Christ when he was in the body he's the same Christ in heaven so it still has all the fullness of God in Christ what that's saying is the son's just as much God as the father the father's just as much God as the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is just as much God as the son he didn't lose anything by putting on a robe of flesh and coming and walking among men okay then verse number 9 I'm sorry verse number 10 and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. So if he's all God, that means that he is all powerful. Right? It says all principality and power. In other words, you're not going to find anything that has authority over God. 
Okay? Even God doesn't have authority over God. God shares authority between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Right? That's why, when you study it out, in the Alpha of time, when God met with God and decided, well, we're going to make man, but we need a plan, everyone was in agreement that the Son would be the one to go, that the Spirit would become the comforter, right? And that the Father would break fellowship with the Son. In other words, God had to disavow God in order for you to get into the family of God. That wasn't one of the Trinity's decisions. They were all in agreement because they are all one. So if Christ has all power, it's good to know that I'm not complete in somebody that has a little power. I'm complete in the one that has all power. So then, verse number 11, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen up with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. In other words, we get a little summary and there's a whole lot packed in there that we can't get to, but we get a little summary of what salvation really does. We are complete in Christ because of verses 11 and 12. Okay, complete meaning the work has been accomplished. Not saying we're perfect yet. One day we will be because we'll get a body fashioned like his. But it's saying in our souls perfect because we're sealed with the Holy Ghost when God did what God did when you got saved there's nothing missing is what it's trying to say here okay, in whom you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands what's that talking about God cut away the old man and made a new man he cut away sin he cut away the flesh and he saved the soul okay, he applied the blood and in, a, in that instant also not just got rid of sin, he sealed it. It was the circumcision made without hands. That's done in the heart, in the soul. Okay, but it says, putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's that? Well, God separated your soul from sin, but we are complete in Christ when we choose to walk in Christ. When we ask Christ to say, Lord, daily, circumcise the flesh from me. What do I need to do, Lord, to allow you to remove the carnality from me so that I can walk spiritually? Because again, it doesn't say that putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the believer. No, I can't do it. You can't do it. It's a work of God every day. Because I'm not stronger than sin. I'm not stronger than my flesh. I can rein it in, but only by the tools and the power that Christ has given us as kings and priests. I can't do it. Christ has to do it. Because the arm of flesh will fail me. Right? But greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. What's that saying? If he does it, nothing can prevent it. But look with me in verse number 12. Buried with him in baptism. That's why one of the great joys is getting to see somebody get baptized. That's just an outward representation of this verse. Because this isn't talking about being dunked in the water. This is talking about being spiritually in your soul baptized with Christ. Right? That you died off to the flesh and that, in verse number 12, buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. What that's saying is when you said, Lord, I deserve to die for my sins, but I believe that you'll save me because you said that you would. I believe that you did everything necessary for me to get saved. What happened in that moment? Well, you died out to sin because Jesus applied the blood. And then somewhere in the midst of all that, because it happened like this. That's how I believe it. But somewhere along the line there, God also raised your soul from the trespasses, because we're dead in trespasses to sin. He raised us again in the newness of life. You went down, and then God brought you up. 
And there's nothing that you can do, I can do, the devil can do, nothing that God can do, because it's impossible for God to lie, to undo that. Can't change that. But when it says through faith of the operation of God, that means God did a whole lot of operating, and all I know is, is that sin's gone, you're sealed, and that you're raised in newness of life. He made you into a new creature. You say, how did he do that? I don't know, I'm not God. That's one of the mysteries. Right? If I could figure out how to do it, I could save you. And I can't. If I could figure out how to do it, there wouldn't be a need for the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost didn't need to perform the operation, and the Holy Ghost didn't need to seal you, then one third of God isn't God. Right? I may be going off in the deep end of here a little bit. But I mean, this is just how I understood it. If there's no need for one third of God, then God doesn't have all power. That's what I'm trying to say. So that operation got how did he do it? I don't know. But I'm glad he did it. Well, you know, what all was necessary for him to do, all I know is, is that it was necessary for Christ to come, die on the cross, and it's necessary for you to realize you as a sinner, and the Holy Ghost to draw you unto God, and you to accept Christ as your Savior. That's all it took for God to do whatever God did. But I'm glad he did. We'll figure it out one day, and even then, it won't matter because we'll be with him, and we won't be able to take our eyes off of him. We'll be, our eyes will be glued to him. Won't matter then. Right? Well, the end part of verse number 12 says, Who hath raised him from the dead? Because Christ got up, God is able to do what God always desired to do. Have a relationship, because when you were dead, you could not be raised to have fellowship with God because sin is enmity with God. God's angry with the wicked every day. Can't fellowship with someone that you're angry with. Why do you think the Bible says that before we can come in and worship and fellowship as the body of Christ, we've got to get ought out of the way? We've got to go to, if I've got, you know, harbor and ought against the brother in my heart, I've got to go and get that made right because I can't fellowship with somebody that I'm angry at or that I've got beef with. I've got to get it made right before I can come in and as a body worship Christ. Because if my toe's angry at my thumb, neither one of them are going to do what I ask them to do. Right, well, because I'm raised, now I can fellowship in Christ. Not just with you, I can fellowship with Christ. Amen. Through Christ, I can fellowship with the Father. Through Christ, I can enter directly into the throne room of God and make my petitions known as if I was standing right before God in heaven. Because that's how he sees it when you pray. It doesn't matter how many people are praying at the same time, he sees them all. Uh, well, that was a long way to go to get to the point that I don't need to know how Jesus is everything that I need. All I need to know is that he's everything that I need. Why do you think so many examples are given throughout the word of what Christ is able to do so that you can believe he's everything you need? I mean, he only said that there is a friend that's like it's closer than a brother. It ain't your friend, it's Christ. It's not somebody you can go out and find in the world. I don't know. He lives inside. Right? That he'd never leave us nor forsake us, which is what Jesus had to endure in order to have the sins of all mankind imputed on the, unto him on the cross. He had to be forsaken by God, the Father, so that God the Son could be made all of our sins. But he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He endured the one thing that he promised us we'd never have to go through after we got saved. But I'm saying all of this to get back to verse number 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And in verse 10, And ye are complete in him. Okay, beware because there's a lot of things out there that are going to try and convince you that verse, the first part of verse number 10 there isn't true. That you are complete in Him. 
but I, I don't know if it was something that I was podcast or book I was listening to this week. Heard something and couldn't get it off my mind ever since then. And I think that this, whatever it was, it was something from either the 80s or the 90s. And it's true then and it's just as true now. The problem with today, and really I would say today in general, but certainly today in society, today in churches, is that nobody's sure of anything. Nobody is convinced of much of anything. And all that it takes is somebody to come along with a suggestion and you're suggested out of something that is true. Because you weren't convinced of it. You weren't sure of it. Back in the day, people called those convictions. Why? Because God convinced you of it deep down in your soul. You want to know why churches look the way that they look today? Because somewhere along the line, people weren't convinced that living in Christ is all that they needed to do. I mean, the Apostle Paul himself said that if you know any other man, if an angel, if he himself came and preached a doctrine other than Christ, let him be accursed. He says, you can take this to the bank, and even if I lose my mind and teach something else, write me off. Because this, what I gave you the first time, was true. Right? There is no second and third revelations. Right? Jesus gave you everything you needed right here. That's why that which is, when that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part visions, seeing in dreams, being called up into the third heaven to see what God wanted you to see so that you could write it down in the Bible, all that went away. The fullness of God dwells in the body of Christ Jesus. We don't need anything else. Through the Holy Spirit, I can commune and fellowship with Him. Right through the Spirit, we can come together as a body and worship Him collectively, in decent and in order, without confusion. Why? Because God did it all perfect the first time around. So if somebody or something or even yourself tries to convince you of something other than Christ, what is in Christ, and that you need to be in Christ, it's a lie. Why do you say why do you think he said in verse number 8 beware lest any man spoil you right if something's good you don't need to do nothing to it right there's a whole lot of ways to spoil something but you can't undo a spoil God can you know, he can apply the blood and it'll take it away but you can take something good and you can make it into other good stuff or you can spoil it and once it's spoiled it can't be used to make anything good again And why is it that we become spoiled when we give in to the vain deceit, to the philosophies of anything other than Christ? Because we're rejecting the very thing. We're substituting Christ with something else in our... But Christ is where we are made perfect. And if you get rid of Christ, you can't be complete anymore. You can't be spiritual anymore. You are rejecting the very one that you had to accept in order to become saved. Right, so what the Lord said up this morning, we're going to talk, teach on complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. And there's a lot of jokers that teach a whole bunch of different things that I can't get on today because we'd be here until, you know, next year, same time. Right, got to get to the thought. But the point I make, a whole lot of things, you can look at it and say, well, does that make man seem like it's man's better than he really is? You know, is that something that you know, it came about because of logic or because God revealed it to somebody? Well, let me help you out. If it bypasses this, God ain't winning it. But if it bypasses what this is, if it's contrary to what the Bible says, it doesn't have anything to do with God. But even further than that, somebody can take a Bible verse and bastardize it. They can take it out of context. Right? It's not just, well... Did it come from the Bible? There's a whole lot of things that have Bible verses in it that the rest of it doesn't even agree with the verses that they've plastered throughout it. And you want to know why people fall for it? Because they're not rooted. They don't know this well enough. And instead of reading their Bible, they'll go and read the thing that has a few Bible verses in it. Very dangerous. Why? Because I'm complete in Christ. He was the Word made flesh. This is the best thing that I have, closest thing that I have to Christ outside of the Holy Spirit. 
Because all that this does is tell me from Genesis to Revelation how Christ loved me so much that before I ever, before there was anything for God to, you know, create man on, before the earth, before he created life, he said, I'm going to die for him. And he, from plan to perfection, right, everything in here is what it took for Christ to come, how Christ did it, what things are going to be like one day when we get with Christ, but more importantly, how to live in Christ, how to be complete. We are made perfect in Christ, not in myself. Right, so let's tackle that first thing, philosophy. Right, if you could think your way out of hell, there have been a whole lot of smart people that God's created on the earth. Right, there are people that through logic one day sat down under a tree and figured out, oh, hey, God uses this thing called gravity to hold us all to the ground. I mean, there are still people out there today that think that the earth's flat. The Bible says that God looked upon the circumference. Well, that, that's round. Okay? Amen. Anyway, we got that out of the way. <laughs> right, but why do people think that the earth's flat? Because they look out and they can't see it curve. It's pretty big. Uh, don't, don't think that you can see the edge of it just by standing out there. I can see a few curves, but that's because we live in Kentucky and we're hillbillies and there's a whole bunch of hills. Right, but they say, well, I look and I don't see a curve. Well, there are a lot of people that look at spiritual things through the eyes of carnality and it doesn't make sense to them. So they try to make it make sense. And then you get doctrines like, well... You know, the Bible says that we should confess our fault to one to another, so I guess that means that there should be a priest and we need to confess our sins to other believers. No. I'm supposed to confess my sins to Christ. Well, how did that come about? Because of the philosophy of man injecting itself into the doctrine of God. And then what do you have? Blasphemy. In fact, let me just up here. You know what the Catholic Church is? They tried to take Christ and take as much of the world and add it to Christ so that as many people or, you know, in pagan religions around the world could swallow the fact that, okay, we'll accept Jesus as long as we keep, you know, get to keep doing the things that we always used to do. That's what it was. Why do you think that, you know, the book of Revelation calls her the whore of Babylon? Because they took what was perfect, Christ, and then messed with it. Amen. And started having dealings with the world. Does that mean every Catholic's going to hell? No. But I believe that it's a camel going through a, the eye of a needle in order for him to do it. What does the philosophy of the world say? Well, you don't need just Christ. That doesn't make sense. That's too easy. The philosophy of the world is, is that, well, if it was such a great cost for God, which it was, it bankrupt heaven. But if it cost God so much, it should cost me something. Yeah, it cost you the old man. You died off. Amen. It cost you your flesh. Amen. But that doesn't make sense to the carnal man. Carnal man says, well, I did something wrong. I should be punished. There has to be, you know, some sort of recompense. I mean, there were religions that taught for, you know, in different sects all over the place that used to teach that if you sinned after you went and you confessed it, and you made it right with God. You had to take a leather belt with a whole bunch of metal studs in it and flog yourself so many times in order to be right with God. You had to punish yourself. As a Catholics, by the way. A whole bunch of other religious teach that you have to do in order to be forgiven. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to man that somebody loves you enough that they would pay everything for you so that you could have what they wanted you to have. But just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's not true. Because the carnal man knows I sinned against God. Why would God want anything to do with me? But see, in order to be spiritual, I can't add to or take away anything. It's either as God said it, or I'm not doing it. Because God cannot honor disobedience, or partial obedience, which is still disobedience. Why do you think Samuel told uh, Saul, you know, obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice was what it took to get back to where you were before you disobeyed. So everything between when you disobeyed 
And when you got back to where you were, that's lost time. That's time where you were not what God wanted you to be. It's just better to do what God said from the beginning. Right? Well, that makes sense spiritually, because now we understand that. But there's a whole lot of Christians that spiritually aren't that grounded. And they understand, well, I can go out and live however I want to as long as I come in, say that I'm sorry on the altar, and I can get up and worship God and go home. No. I mean, you can come to an altar, get right with God, and then go back to the pew and worship that very service. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if there's no repentance, nothing changed in your heart, God knows that. Can't fool God. Right? I'm complete in Christ, not with all this added junk in it. When I start doing what makes sense to me in the flesh, I guarantee you, I'm not spiritual anymore. Because you cannot serve two masters. Love one and hate the other. You either serve God or mammon. If I'm doing what makes sense to the flesh, I'm doing the opposite of what God instructs. So the whole bunch of people try to explain and rationalize, philosophize on what God meant. Well, God meant what he said. That's good enough for me. Don't need to have it explained to me. But then, but to say, vain deceit. Puff it up. Those are people that glorify what you can do. Well, if you go out and hand out this many tracts, you'll be more spiritual. Show me chapter and verse on that. If your spirituality is based off of what you're doing, you have no spirituality. You can't do it. I can't do it. There isn't enough that you can do to become so spiritual that you're what God wants you to be. You know how I know that? Because if you could do that, Christ wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But even then, let's just say that, well, okay, well, we can't reach spiritual perfection in the flesh. But I can do some things that will make me more spiritual. No. You cannot make yourself more spiritual. Because you, in the arm of flesh, the flesh cannot be spiritual. It's an operation that we read about of God, that God increases your spirituality. Because God brings out more of that new creature in you. You did not become spiritual when you got saved. The new creature that God made was already spiritual. Y'all following me here? Okay. So then, if I didn't bring out that new man, why would going out and doing so much or praying so much or all these other things, why would that make me more spiritual? I never made me spiritual. The only way that my spirituality increases is when I get more in Christ and let more of the old man die off. That's what the Apostle Paul said when he said, Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. He's saying, I'm trying to get as far out of the way as possible so that God can increase that spirituality in me. Because the more the old man, our God is a consuming fire. The closer you get to God, the more the old will die off. Because unholiness can't be around holiness. So for you to draw closer to God... If you desire that, it's not a decision. Well, I have to let these things go. No, you just get closer to God. Those things are going to disappear. It's not going to matter anymore. And he replaces what was let go of with more of that new creature. Right? I am perfect. I am complete in Christ. So the more I get in Christ, the more the new man is revealed more spiritual you are now let's backtrack for a second if you're spiritual you will pray but you won't be praying hoping to become more spiritual you'll be praying in order to accomplish those things that God's burdened in your heart you'll pray one to talk with God because you love him you'll pray through intercession for others because you love them because the love of God birthed in your heart you're going to love other people in the church that's how the world will know that we're his disciples that we have love one for another you'll love sinners because Christ died for sinners he went out and became friends with publicans and sinners to win them to God and you'll pray for sinners 
Not because, well, Lord, I'm praying for sinners today because I know it's the right thing to do and I want to become more spiritual. No, if you're spiritual, you're going to pray for sinners. Right? You do not do to become more spiritual because you're spiritual, you do certain things. If you're truly spiritual, you'll evangelize the gospel. You'll get it out, not hoping to become more spiritual. Not hoping that, well, we might have revival if I go out and hand out a few more tracts. No. If revival was contingent on what you do, then we could have revival whenever we wanted to. By the way, we can have revival whenever we want to. We just have to want to. Because God will dump it out. But it's not based on what I do. It's not based on, well, if this person would testify in that service, we might have had a good service. No. If we get out of the way and let God do what God wants to do, then we can have revival. And you know what God wants to do? He wants to draw out that new man so that we're more complete, perfect in Jesus so that we do live spiritually. If you think that, well, I've read, I've sat down and studied my Bible. I don't care if you study a verse, chapter a day. Get what God wants you to get for the day. Right? Listen to the Holy... Learn to discern... You know why people testify in services when God's nowhere near it? Because they don't know what the voice of God sounds like. You know what? It, you know where you learn to do that? Getting in the book. Because the Holy Ghost will start teaching you real quick. Amen. It's not based off of what I do. But vain deceit will tell you that you have the power to bring revival. No, I have the power to get out of the way so that God can send revival. I have the power to say, Lord, I understand very little, but I understand enough to know I'm not good enough. Make me more like you. And really then, that's really not it. It's not make me more like Christ. Lord, put me further into Christ, deeper. I want to go, like Brother Sidney kept saying, you know, come in a little bit further. Lord, take me as close as I can get to him. Because then people won't even see me. Not about me. He must increase. I must decrease. But, but I want to get so close. And in order to get that close, once you get that close, you will be spiritual. Because you can't have fellowship with God while embracing the old man. But we can increase. We can be in Christ if we allow Christ to draw us closer. I can't do, but I can decide. I decided that I would trust Jesus as my Savior. Adam decided to disobey God. Throughout centuries, people have decided whether to accept or reject the gospel. Ever since, you know, the beginning, those that were God's people had to choose whether or not they were going to wake up every day and do what God instructed them to do. I can't do it but I can decide. Well, if I decide that I like the old man better than I do the new man, I'm not going to be spiritual. But I can be complete in Christ when I say, okay, Lord, here's my basket, and everything in that basket is everything that I am. I don't care what you do with it, Lord, because I know you're going to do something better than I can do with it. I don't care how painful it is, how long I'm in the fire. None of that matters to me because I just want to be closer to you. You want to be complete? Get closer to Christ. You want to be spiritual? Get further into Christ. Amen. You want to kill all of that? Decide to stop desiring. Because that's what it all boils down to. The rudiments of this world are that you can do whatever you want to do. Find a way to get away from the consequences and be happy in Him. Ever since the beginning, that's the rudiments of this world. Satan told Eve, you shall not surely die. Well, not in the flesh, but he lied to her because she died spiritually. Amen. The rudiments of this world is you can live however you want, be happy, and have everything that you want, and that eternity doesn't matter. It's all about now. Right? We know the foolishness of that now, but when we were carnal, that made sense to us. And even now, if we embrace that carnal man, it'll still make sense to us. Because we're rejecting Christ. We're to be complete in Christ, 
You just got to let go of everything and say, Lord, draw me closer. David said about his dead son, he cannot come to me, but I can go to him. It's the opposite with Christ. I cannot go to Christ, but Christ can come to me. And he can take me closer. He can take me further into himself. But you know what I have to do? I have to let him. Being spiritual is not hard. He does the work. We have to allow it. We have to stay submissive and humble. You want to be more spiritual? Let more of God into your life. Stop trying to do to merit the presence of God in your life and just live as the Holy Ghost instructs you to. Get out of the way. Because every time I touch the reins and try to take control again, that's the carnal man. You say, well, that's hard. Yeah, it's hard. But he said that he'd be there with us every step of the way. He said his yoke was easy. He's doing all the hard work. The hard part is killing off the rational part of your brain that says, well, everything has to make sense. I have to know what's going on. I have to know where we're going. He's got it all. All I have to do is worry about today. Today's the day that the Lord has made. I have to worry about now. He's got everything else. Tomorrow, later this day, next week. It's all in his hands. But I can decide whether or not what I'm going to do right now is in the will of God or out of the will of God. And you know how you get complete? You get to the point that you discern and you know what God says and you do it. Then you're in Christ and you're complete in Him. You know why people don't? Because people aren't convinced that's the best life for them. They're not convinced that this is the way that God intended it to be. They're convinced that, well, I heard a preacher preach this. Well, did it go against the Bible? Let no man deceive you. Don't spoil yourself because then God can't do nothing for you because you have rejected God's perfect way. What's that? Christ. Not me. Christ. Not what I can do. What Christ already did. Not what God may choose to use me for. No, no, no. Whatever Christ burdens me to do, that's what I'll do. If he gives me a song, I'll sing. If he gives me a message, I'll preach. If he gives me somebody burning on my heart, I'll go tell him. But I'm not going to do anything unless he tells me to. That's complete in Christ. Anything that bypasses that is not of Christ. And if it isn't of Christ, God doesn't want anything to do with it. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.